Work From Home Friday presents Tales from the Blog, in which Trent reads a surely you're not serious blog post. And now, Tales from the Blog. I feel like I should preface this for my viewers that are either not 40 years old or not tech geeks. This post was written in 2006, when a lot of the things that we take for granted today didn't exist yet. And this was my actual cell phone. Oh, Palm Treo, I miss your physical keyboard. Oh. I know you've heard of Windows and Mac, but you may never heard of Linux. It's the operating system that pretty much all of the internet actually runs on, and for a while they made a break for the mainstream. Think of it kind of like Android, except even geekier. Anyway, I hope that helps this blog post make a little bit more sense. On with the show! June 12th, 2006. OS Wars. War as hell, no doubt about that. And when a war lasts more than 20 years, it's even worse. Such is the case with personal computing platforms. The road is strewn with the corpses of the fallen. IBM, Commodore, Tandy, even Atari. And we are left with the big three. Macintosh, Windows, and Linux. For years I've lived in the Windows world, peering out at the other two from a distance and rarely reaching out to touch the grass greener. At my last job I brushed closest to them, I ran the web servers with Red Hat Linux, and our primary client was a school district running entirely on Macs. In that torturous year, torturous for more reasons than just OS platforms, I gained a pretty good understanding of the philosophy behind each of the big three. Now for the first time I have formulated a metaphor which I believe best describes how these things think. Imagine your computer is a car, a utilitarian piece of machinery whose sole purpose is to get you from point A to point B. When you slide into the driver's seat, you are presented with the operating system. The OS then is the system of communication between you the driver and the mechanics of the car. Let's start with the leftmost end of the spectrum, the Macintosh. When you climb into your iCar, the first thing you notice is how plush it is. Soft, comfortable seats, a huge windshield giving you a fantastic view of the road, and the best car audio system on the planet. Sure it's a little pricey, but what a ride. Once you've taken it all in, you decide to take it for a spin. But what's this? There's no steering wheel. There are no pedals. Instead, you have a single big shiny backlit button that says, go. You press the button and miraculously the iCar drives you to work. Brilliant, you marvel. You press the button again and the iCar drives you back home. You never even had to look at the road. Then you decide to go out for dinner. I think I'll try that new Tex-Mex place, you say. You press the button, and before you know it, you are sitting in front of the best and most expensive Italian restaurant. Wait, no, I want to go to the new Tex-Mex place. Besides, Italian gives me gas. You press the go button, and the iCar promptly drives you to a newer, though less reliable, Italian restaurant. Are you deaf? I said Tex-Mex. Before you know it, you are parked outside of Pizza Hut. Curse you, iCar, you shout, banging on the go button, and the iCar promptly locks its doors, trapping you inside until hours later you are able to kick out the side window and walk home. In the center of the spectrum is Windows. The Woodmobile is exactly what you've come to expect from a car. Steering wheel, accelerator, brake, there's a radio, but it plays more commercials than songs. There's a CD player, but last month it destroyed your favorite CD, and now you're afraid to put another CD in it. You get behind the wheel and you drive to work, battling traffic the entire way, bruising your behind on all of the potholes, program errors, cursing the tailgaters, pop-up ads, and around every corner is another construction zone. Security update. After a grueling commute, you grudgingly get back in your windmobile to drive to dinner. You arrive at the Tex-Mex place, only to find out there's a two hour wait to be seated because everyone in town decided to go to the same place to eat. The food is great, but was it really worth all the trouble? Finally, on the right end of the spectrum, we have Linux. To your surprise, the car is totally free. You just walk up to the dealership and get in car Linux is not real concerned with catchy names, who needs marketing when it's free, and you drive away. However, car has no doors, no windshield, and no seatbelt. If you want those, you'll have to buy Red Hat car. You decide it's worth it. Now you feel a little bit more comfortable behind the, um, where's the steering wheel? 
Oh, well, that comes standard with Seuss car, although Seuss car has no doors. If you really think you need it, you can get the wheel for free and bolt it on yourself. You do have your own wrench set, right? You managed to survive your commute, although you did have to stop two or three times to tighten the bolts on your steering wheel because the wrench wasn't really the right size. But now it's time for dinner. Where is that Tex-Mex place? Voila, your car comes with a free phone book, man page. You look up Tex-Mex, but instead of directions to the restaurant, you find the following instructions. Put fajita meat in tortilla. These can be downloaded for free. Frozen margarita strongly recommended. There's tequila in the trunk. Once you're drunk, you should avoid the cops, but just in case, there's a gun in the glove box. <sighs> Think, there's too much hands in that. I don't know what to do with my hand. Let's start with the left. Your left, my left, my left. Your car comes with a phone book. A phone book? Wow, this is old. Uh. Peanut. Thank you.